Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, worshippers of all ages, welcome back to YouTube. My name is Sea Raptor, and today we are continuing our Learn to Play series for the American Destroyer line as we take a look at Tier 6's USS Farragut. Now, Farragut was a real ship. This They, they built a, a number of these, uh, mostly entering service in the early 1930s. Um, several of these were still in service early in the Second World War, but they were largely being phased out in favor of some of the, the ships that came, uh, came in the, by the late 30s and certainly by the, the early 1940s, the, by the mid-war, um, most of these guys would have probably been relegated to, I don't know, uh, some kind of some, some sort of convoy duty, that sort of thing, back uh, back closer to home. Uh, not many of them would have seen blue water action, let's say, I don't think. They just lacked, they lacked many of the tools that destroyers of the era needed to fill the roles they were being plugged into. Farragut in World of Warships is, well, I'll be honest, she's a downgrade from Nicholas. Um... And it, it feels a little bad, right? You you play Nicholas at tier five, you're like, oh man, this ship's really good. That's got a lot going for it. I can't wait to see what the next one is. And you get to Farragut, and honestly, Farragut is a disappointment. Um, she this the play style of the two ships is almost identical. Once you understand how to play Nicholas, learning to play Farragut is honestly really easy, but you do have to make some adaptations. And we'll talk about what they are along or what I feel they should be along the way, because there are a couple of major statistical anomalies, if you want my opinion, changes along the way that radically change what you can and can't achieve with this ship. So let's uh, let's dive in and, and start uh, start having a look around. Survivability. You see they're fully buffed with survivability expert Farragut clocks in at 13,600 hit points. Her stock health, or well, I should say her maximum health out of her out of her base hull is 11,500 hit points. That is less than Nicholas. In fact, it is worst in tier at tier six. Think about that for a minute, guys. In seven years, Farragut is still the lowest health tier six destroyer in World of Warships. Seven years in, that's kind of hurt. That kind of it's kind of hurtful, right? It, that feels bad. And this is one of those key statistics I was talking about that radically changes how you're able to play this ship. One of the things about Nicholas, and I mentioned in that video, right? You want to jealously guard your health early because it allows you to take risks and be a bit of a destroyer bully later on in the game. Now, there are times that that's not necessarily the right play. When you look across the opposing destroyer lineup in a Nicholas, and let's say it's all Japanese destroyers, just to pick an easy example, you can probably be able to be a bit of a bully from right out of the gate, right? However, you can't do that in Farragut. In Farragut, you have to play cautious from the moment you spawn into a game. And if you don't, you will find yourself back in port wondering what in the hell happened to you because that is that is a depressingly common problem with this ship. Every other tier 6 destroyer has more health than you and just about every destroyer in your matchmaking bracket has more health than you. Occasionally, you will get down a tier 5 game and you will be able to bully some of those aforementioned Japanese destroyers, but that is going to be the exception to the rule, so you cannot you can't go in with that as your default mindset. All right. Keep that in mind. You you are incredibly fragile and you have less health to throw around than your predecessor. It's one of the few instances in World of Warships where by moving up a tier, the ship you move to has less health than the predecessor. And it hurts here um, than, than almost any other instance I can think of it occurring. Armor layout? LOL. You have no armor. You're a destroyer. Get over it. You've got 16 millimeter plate throughout. Even the little 120 millimeter pop guns the European destroyers get will full pin you. So yeah, suck it up. You're taking damage when you get shot at. Maneuverability and concealment. This is something that, well, at least from the maneuverability perspective, Farragut doesn't struggle with. Um, you see there at 38.3 knots, that's with the speed flag, her base speed, 36 and a half knots. That's pretty solid. It's very competitive. Most tier six destroyers are 36 knots or thereabouts. There's a handful that are slower at like 35 knots, and there's a handful that are speedier at like 38 knots, but there's not a huge wide swath of speeds at tier six, like just about everybody is between 35 and 38 knots and you are right smack in the middle of that range. So you're very competitive. So she's, she can get around the board just like her contemporaries. 560 meters on the turning circle, 2.7 on the rudder shift. She handles pretty well. Um, one of the nice things about the American destroyer line, and I, I didn't really talk about this in Nicholas's video, but I'll point it out here because it's going to be something that you're going to continue to see as you play these ships. They have a pretty short overall length, right? There's generally not a ton of wasted space forward of the forward of the first gun or aft of the last gun. It means that that compact overall length means that the ship handles very well. She's very responsive to the rudder. One of the other things that I think is underrated a bit, and I'll talk about this while we're talking about handling, the American destroyers are also very responsive to engine commands. What do I mean by that? Well, 
when you're speeding up, most ships have a fairly constant number for acceleration. The British ships tend to be, break those rules. Um, but in general, when you, you know, you're sitting still, you, 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 you press W and go up to full speed. It takes a few seconds, of course, to build up some steam. Destroyers accelerate faster than battleships, as you would expect. That's the laws of physics can still apply to world of warships mostly, but, um, but that's to be expected. But one of the things you learn playing different destroyers in different lines is that they decelerate at different rates. Different ships are more responsive when you cut their engine power. Um, the American, the American line is very responsive when you cut that engine power. These ships settle to a lower speed very quickly. It makes it easier to potentially dodge incoming fire. Certainly makes it easier to dodge and play around with torpedo, you know, dodge torpedoes that are coming at you. You see the gap. You realize if I stay at full speed, I'm going to run right into this torpedo. Cut your speed down to half. Make the turn. And there you go. So that's something that else that you'll want to kind of a skill you want to develop as you as you play the line is learn when to cut your throttle. These ships will reward you for figuring that out. Concealment. This is bad. This is something that the ship doesn't do well. And in fact, 6.6 .6 you see there is a full stealth rig Farragut. That is worst in tier. That feels terrible. Think about this for a minute, guys. I've now taken what should nominally be a gunboat destroyer, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, and I've married it to the smallest health pool in her tier and the worst detection in her tier. That generally doesn't make for a great combination. It's one of the reasons that playing Farragut is such an extreme challenge. Um, so yeah, just no going in that j certainly everyone, every tier six destroyer you meet will outspot you. The overwhelming majority of tier five destroyers you meet will outspot you. There are some tier seven destroyers that you, you can spot first. But most of those are things that you don't want to get in a gunfight with. I'm looking at you, Leberek Moss, right? Like, we, most people look at Leberek Moss and think, that ship is not very good. And in truth, it's it's fairly mediocre. But this ship doesn't want to get in a gunfight with a Leberek Moss because that guy has almost double my health pool. So, yeah, don't, uh, don't, pick fights with, don't pick fights with bullies, let's put it that way. So, yeah, concealment, not what this ship does well. You're going to always, always, always be fighting that concealment number, and it's, it's going to suck. Main battery, you're familiar with this. You've got two super-firing American 127mm 38 caliber guns here up forward of the bridge. You've got one amidships, and you've got two back aft. The midships and aft guns are the same as Nicholas. It's this midships gun that is new. Right here, just after the stack, I have, I have, I guess, uh, turret number three or whatever you'd call it. Okay. Um, this gun is a little frustrating to use, and it's all about the turret angles. Let me see if I can kind of position the camera to show you. This is probably about as good as it's going to get. So, as you can see, when I'm trying to fire the barrel forward, let's see if I can get a better top down angle, right? I've probably got maybe. 40, maybe 38 degrees, 30 or 40 degrees off the bow that I can fire this gun forward. Firing it off the uh, over uh, back aft, I have all the angle in the world. I only have to worry about not shooting through this superstructure here. I probably have only a, a, a maybe about a 10 degree, maybe a 12 degree arc here through the aft that I can't fire directly over the stern. After that, I can use this gun all day long. But firing forward over the bow... I have to get, you have to get way over like here to be able to get all the guns into action. And when you do that, look how much of the ship is exposed. Certainly all of this above the waterline forward of the stacks. So you have an extra gun, yes, but using it when you're pushing into a target is more challenging. Using it when you're running away from a target is much more, much more, uh, much more, much less complicated. So keep that in mind. Um, you have an extra gun, but there's, you know, when you're moving towards what you're shooting at, uh, unmasking it and getting it into action is more risky. You will take more damage when you do that. The reload uh, compared to Nicholas is the same. You're still looking at a four second base. Um, the turret traverse base is the same. It's 12 seconds. I've got a, I've got uh, the module installed. That's why it's, you're seeing it there. It's lower at, at 10.4. Range is better. 12.6 kilometers of range is better than what Nicholas had down at tier uh, tier five. So she stopped, she kept that at 10.9. So you've got almost almost two kilometers more of range. Um, it means that Farragut, when she wants to, can occasionally play the role of Atlanta, right? Ah, I'm going to sit behind this island and lob shells and pick on something stationary. And when you have that opportunity, you should probably take it because it's one of the few times you'll really get to spend a lot of time just sitting around open water firing with this ship. Shells are the same. Shell velocities are the same. Shell ballistics are the same. These are the same guns. Get used to it. You're going to be firing them for a while. Torpedoes. Same verse, similar verse as Nicholas, right? Um, I have 
torpedoes with only a 6.4 kilometer range versus my 6.6 kilometer detection. So I cannot torpedo anything in the open water that cannot, that can't spot me unless they're driving towards me, right? So if I'm firing torpedoes at someone moving towards me, they're going to close that range and I have the opportunity to use them much easier than if I'm uh, in any other way, basically. You can't chase someone down from a stern and if they're running away from you, land these torpedoes. That's just not going to happen. A couple other quirks from Nicholas, of course, is Nicholas had the two triple launchers on each side of the ship. Farragut trades those for two quad launchers that are mounted on the center line. It makes them a little easier to use and then I can vomit out eight torpedoes over either side of the ship anytime I want. The bad news is that once I've done that, I don't have any backup. There's no reserve. The reload on these is 88 seconds. That's about 20 seconds longer than uh, than we saw down at Nicholas uh, at, tier, at Tier 5. The reason for that is the extra barrel, right? Wargaming basically bases the reload speed off a tor on a torpedo launcher off of how many tubes it has. So a triple torpedo tube launcher will reload faster than a quad will reload faster than a quint and so on. They are more or less the same torpedoes that you saw down at Nicholas at Tier 5 as well. It's the same alpha, the same, I believe it's about the same detection. I think these might be a hair faster, but they don't hit any harder. So these torpedoes, just like Nicholas, will be more cha are challenging to use. You have to look for opportunities. Again, ships that are pushing towards you, um, being able to fire them from, you know, someone pushing around an island and they don't know you're there. Those kinds of opportunities are, are more or less what you're limited to. You also could potentially be looking for the... Uh, the French-style suicide strike, right? You could charge someone and just vomit torpedoes into their hull at point-blank range. I mean, if, if you, the opportunity presents itself and that's what you want to do, these will probably do a fairly effective job. The trick is your ship will probably go down in the process or you'll have so little health left that uh, you, won't be, you won't be able to do that more than once. Let's just put it that way. Um, depth charges. This is another area where, again, we're taking a step backwards from Nicholas. If you recall, Nicholas had... Two, two charges of eight bombs each in a charge. Farragut starts with a stock stock number of two charges with six bombs each in a charge. Because she's an American destroyer, they still hit like trains. That's good. But she's putting fewer of them over the side every time you push the button. That's not good. One of the reasons you're seeing four charges here is because I've taken the depth charge modification on this ship. Very specifically to help alleviate the fact that I'm putting so few bombs into the water. Once, I, once I've got a submarine under my keel, I know where he is, and I want to hound him to death, I want to be able to keep pushing out charges as best I can, and having those extra, extra racks available allows me to do that. So that's a, that's a personal choice, and we'll talk more about that when we get to upgrades. So yeah, another place that this ship is a bit of a downgrade from Nicholas. A defense is one, one place where things are more or less the same. Um, flak, you're putting up the same number of flak puffs. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're putting the same number of flak puffs. You're seeing two there because I've got Fearless Brawler on the captain. So she has a base of one flak puff. Uh, let me make sure that's correct. Yep, one flak puff there at uh, um, 12, whatever it is, 1250 damage or so. I mean, you'll occasionally hit mid-tier uh, mid carriers with these. I wouldn't expect to get too much on a, on a tier 8 carrier with them. By tier 8, most carrier players have learned how to steer around just a little bit of flak. Continuous damage is okay. It's again, it's a slight tick up from um, from Nicholas, but it's not amazing. You're looking at 56 in the outer bubble and 48 in the inner bubble. The the dual purpose guns, uh, you've got that extra gun that gives you just a little bit extra in the long range, and then of course your your short range bubble on the back of the 20 millimeter Orlicons and the 50 cal Brownings uh, gives you just a few extra DPS. So yeah, I, what you know if you. you the, the the A on the ship will be effective against tier six carriers. It will not be effective against tier eight carriers in almost any sense of the word. So you have to be, if you're in a game with a tier eight carrier, you have to be much more cautious about when you leave your AA, when you choose to turn it on, simply because there's just there's just fewer things you're gonna be able to kill. Quick look at captain skills. Um, yep, just like before, preventive maintenance, last stand, survivability expert, and concealment expert. I think are the default ten points you should chase. After that, spend your next three on Adrenaline Rush. Past that, you have some options. You've got Turret Traverse for one point. You've got Demolition Expert for two points. You've got Main Battery and AA Specialist for three points. Priority Target for two points is not a bad choice. For me, I've gone for, I've gone for Fearless Brawler here for four points. This is probably not the right choice, right? As I sit here and build this video, you know, analyzing the ship, talking about, hey, you probably don't want to you know, be running around getting into too many gunfights. Here I have taken a skill called Fearless Brawler. So I might actually go back and rejigger this. But for the moment, this is the skill I've taken. 
this is probably not where I would go with the next four points on a Farragut build. You probably want to be focused more on, um, well, you know, this and the turret traverse might not be a bad skill. Um, I would not invest anything in the torpedo skills. I just don't think these torpedoes are going to be impactful enough over the course of a game to be worth it. You certainly don't want to fool with main battery range, but you know, buffing your range that that's not a thing. So yeah, um, fearless brawler is maybe a skill that you'll get some use out of, but probably not where I should be putting my next four points. I'll probably rejigger this after I'm done with the video. So this, the same advice I give you down at Nicholas, uh, for captain skills really still applies here because the ship plays almost exactly the same. Have a quick look at consumables. You're, you've seen this before, though. You're getting damage control party, that sexy American smoke generator, and a choice between defensive fire and engine boost. I've made my case for defensive fire at this point. I will always take it on the American destroyers that have access to it. If you don't want to, that's you. But when, but if, I'm just warning you right now, when a carrier's in a game, you don't get to complain. Wargaming offered you a tool to, to help piss off the carrier player and make him go away, and you didn't take it. So I got no sympathy for you. <laughs> just keep that in mind, all right? Um... Stock uh, stock module upgrades, main armaments mod one, I think is really the only good choice here. You could make a case for magazine mod, but I wouldn't. It's just not worth it. This is a better pick. Um, here in slot two, again, I'm taking engine room protection. Um, if you would rather run engine boost instead of defensive fire, you feel free to take engine boost mod. I would not. I still think here at tier five and tier six, there's not there's not enough value in taking defensive fire uh, modification one. So that's just me. Your A is okay, but I don't know. I just wouldn't. I, I think engine room is a much better pick. Um, just like Nicholas here in slot three, uh, you have a ch there. These top four options are all decent choices: main battery mod, A guns mod, aiming systems mod, and torpedo tubes mod. All all of those have can you can make a case for. Of them, I think the torpedo tubes mod is the weakest. I would not go here. I know I did this on Nicholas, but I did it mainly there for the torpedo speed. These torpedoes are a little faster already, so it's not quite as bad. Past that, I think aiming systems mod is probably your next weakest choice. I mean, you're firing sh uh, you know shells every four seconds. If you miss, your guns are going to reload pretty quick. Like, um, you know, don't really need to be super concerned about where the shells go because you're putting out so many. So to me, the top choices are going to be these two. With that said, if you're playing in a division a lot, uh, if you're going to be divvying up with buddies a whole lot while you grind your Farragut and they're, they want to play like a light cruiser or something, smoke you can you can get some use out of smoke generator mods. So don't don't totally discount that in the right situation. And in slot four, there are really only two good choices. That's going to be propulsion mod and depth charges mod. I've explained why I've taken depth charge mod. Um, maybe I'll uh, include a little footage to help, help you help you visualize why I've done that. But um, but yeah, this is my choice. But propulsion mod is a solid pickup if you want to do that. Steering gears and, and damage control mod on a tier on a mid tier destroyer are just not worth it. Don't waste your time on that. All right, so now that we've had a look around. We've kind of toured the ship, talked through a build. Let's go have a look at some gameplay. All right, welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to the south spawn of Northern Lights. I am bottom tier, which is, well, it's not a very comfortable place to be as a Farragut. Even as a top tier destroyer, as we've noted, this thing has some, well, it's got an uphill battle. As a bottom tier destroyer, though, it gets even more interesting. Take a look at the team lineups. You're going to find two radars on the opposing team. No planes. So my defensive fire won't get used this game, probably. But I'm okay with that, because remember... If there's no planes in the game, I'm already ahead. Now, one of the things that I have to consider looking over the opposing uh, team lineup is what can spot me? And the answer is, well, over there, everything. The Farragut, at best, has the same detection I do, and the other, tips, the other two ships absolutely outspot me. The advantage I have spawning where I am is that I have a Cleveland, a friendly Cleveland, directly astern of me. And so it's going to afford us the opportunity to do something you don't see a lot of in random battles ladies and gentlemen what do you not see a lot of in random battles raptor you don't see a lot of team play so here we go we're going to put down one of these nice big fat american smoke screens for my cleveland so he can move up just a little closer to the cap circle and hopefully support my poor poor low health butt as we try to contend and make a play for this cap but you'll notice i am not i am not Moving into a position where my detection radius, you can see it there on the mini-map, is anywhere near the top end of that cap circle. I don't want to get spotted. I don't want to get, as Zath would say, robocopped. Now, the opposing gauge shows up at a range that I would not expect to have found him. I'm going to pause here real briefly to talk about this. That tells me he doesn't yet have concealment expert. He is going to spot me here in just a moment, right about there or so. 
Yep, there we go. So now since I'm lit, to hell with it, might as well open fire, get some damage on this guy. He'll probably fire back, and that's okay. I'm spotting him for my team. Friendly Cleveland's chipping in. The Budioni and the Zeton behind me are chipping in. As long as everybody pitches in a bit, this is good. And I've moved to the west to where I've got a nice bit of cover here from the uh, enemy cruisers that are lurking back up along the D-line. Now, the Kekdun, who's just the other side of the cap, tries to drop his little goofy uh, Dutch bombs on me. He doesn't land anything, blessedly. But we did a lot of good work to that enemy Gade before he finally managed to get a little cover. And I'm... I'm convinced we can bag that guy with a little bit of effort. But for the moment, he's got some hard cover, and he's capping. I'm going to get flipped around just a bit. The Cleveland's got his sonar up. That'll help protect him from torpedoes in there. And now we see the enemy Kekdun is also moving in. This is, well, this is bold, ladies and gentlemen. My thoughts are still on the opposing destroyer. You can see him there down under 1,000 HP. I'm going to let the Cleveland and the Zeton go to town on this light cruiser for the moment. I really want this destroyer off my board. I'm thinking maybe I can get a sneak a couple of shells over. I can't tell if they're hitting or not. Cleveland takes care of it. And now the enemy Kektun is trying to sneak in there. Now the only reason I'm able to make some of these plays with my guns is because I'm, I'm putting the ship in a position that only one thing at a time is able to shoot at me. Right? The Tallinn, the Amalfi, even that North Carolina, even if I'm spotted over there in the, on, when I'm, let's see, if I'm just at the west of this, I'm on the 7 line behind that island, just off to my, my uh, port bow, they can't shoot me, right? So I'm limiting the potential damage just by, you know, using island cover to say, look, you may know where I am, but you can't shoot me. So I'm, again, I'm jealously guarding my health early. There's the enemy Kektun. He can spot me now. And I've got decent shots at this guy, so we're going to pull up the AP. You guys, if you watch the Nicholas video, you've seen what the American AP is capable of against the right target. My thought process here is, hey, this is an opposing light cruiser. Surely I can do mean things to him. But so far, all I'm managing to do is overpin. You can see I'm shooting him basically from the stacks aft. I'm finally starting to get pins as I try to lead the shells just a little farther forward. So kind of let that be a lesson. This is another one of these things you got to kind of learn where to shoot if you're going to shoot at a, uh, uh, an enemy cruiser with your AP. Certainly the this little the, this American uh, destroyer AP. Spend a little time. If, if you're going to try it, maybe spend some time in a training room or with bots just derping around saying, hey, where can I pen? Where can I potentially citadel? Now that I've got some cover and my team is spotting for me, I'm just going to sit here and pepper this guy with HE. I'm looking for resets. I don't want him to cap. And I'm figuring maybe eventually I can get a fire lit. Maybe with enough, uh, enough focus fire on this guy, we can whittle him down. My friendly Cleveland has taken a bit of a too aggressive position and, well, he's out now. The Zeton, on the other hand, is getting flipped around, and honestly, that's the right play in my mind. There's no need for him to be up there, plus he's already got two of those big old fat 16-inch turns off his stern. So that's a pretty good spot. I'm getting close to finishing off this little Dutch cruiser, but the Zeton's going to come in and take care of things. With five minutes gone in this game, nine ships, five on their side, four on ours, are already out. Well, <laughs> make that ten. So it's been a bit of a bloodbath. We have a, a two-ship lead. Nobody has controlled yet either, any of the caps that started uh, you know, open for, open for play at the start of the game. And now that I've got a pretty good handle on where everybody else on the enemy team is, only now, knowing there's no destroyer here, all their destroyers are dead, knowing there's no radar cruiser here, all their radar cruisers are dead, now I will push up into the cap circle. Farragut is a bit of a frustrating ship in the line for this reason, right? If you push caps too soon, too early, particularly when you're bottom tier and there's radars in a game, you will get mauled. Absolutely mauled. Now, the Zeton is pushing up behind me. I can see him kind of making this move. And so my thought process, he's, he's going to get focused by a couple of ships. Let's lay him some smoke. Maybe try to screen him just a bit. And, uh, and give him some, some angles from which he can fire behind. Maybe he can climb up here in this smoke. I don't know. But it, at least afford him the opportunity. Now, the last smoke worked out really well. The Cleveland did some good work in there. This smoke, unfortunately, is not going to turn out so well. He eventually, he's not really going to use it all that much. So this is a bit of a waste. But I am, I am trying, right? I'm almost within my detection radius of this North Carolina. And it looks like he might try to push up behind this island. Now, knowing battleship players as I do, he'll probably slow down and try to stop just the other side of that island, or at least just to where he's, his bow just barely sticks you know, past the edge of it. So I'm going to lead those torpedoes, assuming that he's going to slow down as he comes out from behind cover. 
have managed to pick up a cap here. So between my cap and my defense ribbons, already this ought to be a decent little XP result, particularly, again, from bottom tier. Unfortunately, the North Carolina has either smelled me out or sensed my torpedoes or whatever, but, so those are all going to miss. I overled them just a hair, and uh, you see they had the range to do what they wanted because they were moving into the range. I just, I didn't get the lead correct. With the Zeton here basically charging to his death, I've got this candy smoke. Let's make let's make the best of it. And the Zeton does some really good work right there, landing at least two citadels on this North Carolina. Between my guns and the Zeton's secondaries and his main battery, we are going to do some more good work on this guy. There's a there's fire number two. Zeton gets off one more parting shot, gets another full pin or two up forward, and my fires and my HE are going to put this guy out. As a bottom-tier destroyer, killing a top-tier battleship always feels good. So now if you look over the map, kind of the mini-map, you can sort of see, again, no one has ever capped C. We're down to this Rochester, this Ashitaka, who seems allergic to playing forward. I've got a Budioni and a Nagato off to my port side south of me. Nagato's very healthy. Budioni at about half HP. And the Rochester is somewhere off to my starboard side, off to the northeast. I know exactly where the Heinrich is, so we're going to get out here. I'm going to just, my goal is I'm going to try to move out here and do a little spotting for the Nagato. And there we go. There's the Rochester lit on the surface. So now I have a couple of options here. What I'm processing at the moment is, okay, do I want to try and cut over further west and get torpedoes on the Heinrich? Well, not much point to that. He just bought it. So now with a two-ship lead, we're ticking up caps faster. I feel a little more comfortable staying back here and maybe trying to help this Nagato tag team this Rochester a bit. The Rochester, if you'll recall, is essentially, uh, I believe it's, for, it's an Oregon City Hull, but she has smoke. She doesn't have radar. Ordinarily, playing this close to an American heavy cruiser would mean my death. At the moment, though, I can get away with it because he has no way to spot me outside of Hydro, and his Hydro range at tier 8 would only be about four and a half, four or five kilometers, something along those lines. For the moment, basically, I'm okay. But he's turning south, guys. He's turning south, so if I'm very clever with my throttle, I can use this island just off my starboard bow to block his line of sight and potentially put some torpedoes in his path. Now, I, I kind of use the lead indicator there in a bit of a dumb way. I should have shorted those a bit, expecting him to slow down and smoke up. That is, in fact, what's going to happen. I'm not going to land those torpedoes. But you see the kind of games you have to play to get effective use out of those torpedoes. Without that island, he already knows that I'm there. Right? He's probably not even going to give me the opportunity for that shot. If I had, if I had led those torpedoes better or just differently, um, he might have taken those. Now, knowing Rochester as I do, what I'm expecting him to want to do is sit in smoke and try to farm this Nagato. But Rochester's firing penalty is such in the smoke that if I sit out here where I've got a clear line of sight into his smoke cloud, as soon as he pulls the trigger, I'll be able to spot him in his smoke just like that. He didn't think, he didn't suspect I was here or didn't know I was here. Something along those lines. And now, the only thing keeping me from firing, do you see it? My firing range is 12.6 kilometers. I'm broadside of this Rochester. He's in smoke. He has no way to spot me. I could fire at him right now, except that Ashitaka, see off in the distance on the left-hand side of your screen, would spot me. So what I'm doing right this instant, I'm waiting for the Ashitaka to edge out of my range. Right there he does. And now, it's time to beat up on this Rochester. The struggle is, now that he knows he's going to get spotted as soon as he fires... He's not firing anymore. Well, isn't that a bummer? The good news is, my torpedoes are about to come back up, and that guy is right at the edge of my torpedo range. It's worth attempting in, a, in any way. So, we're going to go widespread here, and we're just going to vomit torpedoes out. This is luck chuck, right? I'm just like, eh, let's vomit them out and see what happens. Now, unfortunately for me, he does something that I don't expect. What I'm expecting him to do... You saw him, I'm going to pause the game real fast. He was reversing, right? He was reversing to get out of that smoke and get out of the Nagato's way so he didn't get crushed. And I was expecting him to keep re reversing back to the east around that island and stay on the D-line. But what's going to happen in a moment, it turns out, he turned his engines on, he came out of that smoke, and uh, oopsie, now he knows I'm here. That's an uncomfortable feeling. Luckily for me, as we were talking about, he has no way to spot me outside of Hydro. And at the moment, I am just outside even his best hydro range. And if he would, if he wanted to turn port to his port and come after me, he'd have to show a beautiful, beautiful broadside shot to that Nagato. And he clearly doesn't want to do that. So now I can sit in smoke here and use the Nagato as a spotter 
to farm some damage off this Rochester. Now again, I'm firing the AP. You have to know where to be aiming, right? You don't want to be aiming. You won't get citadels, right? That that American cruiser has 106 inches of belt armor. I'm not going to get my little dinky AP shells through this. However, I can get full pins on his casemate, his upper works, through his deck, and into his superstructure. And you see there, look at the look at the shell totals on the right. I've got 17 full pins and only three overpins. That that those full pins were worth more damage than HE. So that was again another instance using the AP out of the guns is the right call. Only two ships left on the board. I've got both of my kills are tier 8 boats. That ought to be worth something for when it comes time to, to tabulate the XP totals. And hey, this smoke is here. I don't want it to go to waste, right? So we're going to load the HE, and we're going to try and do a little bit of Nagato farming here at long range. At this point, the game is largely over. They only have two surviving ships. The the Ashitaka more or less never left the spawn area, and he's now on the A line, so he basically won't get the chance to be impactful, well, ever again. But you can see the kinds of problems I'm having even at this range, right? I'm I'm even I'm at 10 kilometers. I've still got more range than this, but I'm having I'm having a hard time leading the shells on this guy. Right? This is a battleship. He's not fast, he's not maneuverable, but it still takes a little bit of time and effort to kind of work out, okay, where do I need to be going? How do I do this? Of course, he's changing his speed as well which is also making my job just that much more difficult. I'm really hoping for a fire here that I can get to stick. He was on fire a minute ago, and I think he used his DCP to put it out. So if I can get a fire to stick on him, that would be really super sexy. But I don't think it's going to happen. He changed his speed yet again. Slowed down once more. My smoke has just expired. I'm now out of smoke. You see it there. So I don't want to get shot and dead this late in the game. I don't want to screw up. It's like, why give him free points? So there you go, guys. That's this, this game is over. I'm not gonna, it, it, long story short. The Ashitaka lives. We win the game, etc., etc., etc. All right. So let's take a look at the results screens here. As you can see, right, uh, almost 200 shell hits. Good work out of the guns. Both my kills were tier eight, just tier eight ships. So that ought to count a little bonus for me, uh, killing from bottom tier like that. Farragut is a ship where you really have to be picking and choosing your targets very, very carefully. And you know, you want to be getting into gunfights with things that are already well on their way to being dead or largely crippled or whatever. Or, again, as you saw, use hard cover where you can lob shells over, use your teammates as spotters, sit in smoke, anything you can do to avoid getting shot. I'm, I've been ragging on Farragut a bit because she's in my mind she's not as good as Nicholas, and she's not. But the reality is, is that it's good training for how you're going to end up playing some of the other ships in this line. So you see here the XP result over 1,800 base. As a bottom-tier destroyer in a game I only had one cap and... What? What did I have in terms of spotting damage? Uh, only 32,000. I did not have a lot of damage, spotting or inflicted or otherwise, but I had one cap, and my two kills were I managed to kind of clean up a couple of top-tier ships. That makes a big, big difference. And of course, earnings-wise, not too shabby here. Uh, can't really say I'm upset with this. I've got the little captain skill, the blue commander skill, blue commander modifier in there. About 30,000 come out captain XP there on an 1,800 base game. All right, guys, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that game in Farragut. Pretty low damage game. I mean, as you would kind of expect, your bottom tier in that situation, I'm I'm just trying to do what I can, using the smokes for my team, getting some spotting, getting some harassing damage in where I can. And um, that's about all you can really do, especially from bottom tier like that. So um, not an amazing game. Certainly not a game that I, would, uh, that I would put on my YouTube channel like, oh, look at me. But I think it highlights the... The challenges that this ship faces, certainly in the tier, the matchmaking she's going to get, um, and what you have, the kind of trade-offs and, and things you have to be making to, uh, to try and, and get good XP results out of it. This ship is a challenge to grind. No two ways about it. Anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed our Learn to Play video here for Tier 6 American Destroyer USS Farragut. I will see you next time when we bring you Mahan. In the meantime, y'all take care. Peace.